Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'd uh, just like to say a warm welcome to Juan Rico. Juan is a former colleague of Antonio and myself. He's now working at Tekka. Uh, Deborah's not here this week. She's in uh, in China, so it's just the three of us. So Juan, it's great to have you with us. You're, you're a regular on Access Chat in, on Twitter. So it's it's ironic that you had to leave our company and join another one before we got to interview you, but I'm, I'm glad you're here now. So tell us about yourself, your interests, and, and how, how you came to be engaged in the space, and then a bit about what you're doing now at Tekka. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. It's a really honor to, to be here. Uh, you all know <laughs> how important for me is the, our Tuesday activities. So just a, a quick introduction on, on myself. I'm a telecommunications engineer. I have been working with uh, mainly wireless communications for the last 15 years. I started working as research uh, intern in, in the University of Cantabria here in, in Spain. Uh, dealing basically with uh, what was called at that time machine-to-machine -machine communications. Then it, uh, the name evolves towards um, Internet of Things. I moved to a spin-off company created by my colleagues there and basically we, we were uh, in the early stages of uh, IoT dealing with uh, smart city staff, creating devices for uh, monitoring, um, uh, waste monitoring, for um, uh, parking parking sensors, uh, lighting control, so very, very focused on the technological part of, um, of the IoT and the smart cities. After that, I moved to Atos uh, four years ago, and uh, there I was working in uh, energy and transport department, uh, first as a researcher, then I was promoted to, to lead the, um, the energy part. And uh, that time was uh, when I met uh, for the first time the uh, Access Chat. Um, basically because one of the projects uh, in which I was involved uh, was trying to build an app for person with uh, special needs in Madrid, basically to support them uh, how to use public transport and avoid uh, crowded areas to, let's say, minimize the risks that, that they are exposed to. So uh, then uh, after the first engagement, it was uh, really easy to keep uh, well, with the topic because uh, the implications of, uh, let's say, uh, social sciences in, in the engineering uh, area is something that I have uh, really appreciated for many, many times. Uh, besides my engineering role, I always enjoy reading philosophy things, so it kind of uh, mix that uh, makes me appreciate uh, or makes me push uh, things that uh, it's not only how cool technology is, but uh, how useful uh, things are and in which way we are helping or supporting people to minimize the problems or to solve, if it's possible, the, their problem. Then in June, I moved to Teca. Teca is an appliance uh, manufacturer, and here my role would be to is to to lead the um, smart home uh, group. Basically, we have uh, many different uh, well home do major domestic appliances that basically covers the kitchen, and uh, well we are starting to introduce connectivity. And since the connectivity market in the kitchen is something that is not uh, really uh, well hitting as expected uh, to, to end customers. Uh, what uh, my role is uh, a bit uh, how to focus our approach, basically to, to, to make it uh, profitable and not only a, a nice technical solution. Excellent. I was failing to take myself off mute for a second there. Um, and, and, and I think that you know, it's it's clear to me your your tangible enthusiasm for the topic. Your your regular contributor to the chat. Um, you know, we've had numerous sort of previous conversations whilst colleagues about including people 
I think you know, the the area that you're working in now uh, around the home is is a is a particularly important one because mm -hmm. you know, these these are the fundamental basic you know, appliances, home devices, are the fundamental building blocks of a, of people's quality of life. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, <laughs> being able to prepare your food, you know, yeah. things that keep you alive, uh, you know. Uh, things that keep you warm, all of these kind of things. So, if you're, um, yeah, what what are the sort of things that you take into account when when you're as a, as a group when you're you're making stuff? How do you be inclusive um, when when you're when you're designing stuff? And how how do you also try and include your audience when you're communicating about the work that you're doing? Yeah, uh, that, that's a, a quite tricky thing because uh, let's say that uh, now the, the market and all big companies are, are taking like two different approaches combined, but uh, at the end they are quite different and independent. That on the one hand they are trying to create things uh, as sophisticated as possible uh, using latest technologies, but uh, mainly for the sake of uh, selling how advanced they are. But uh, from my point of view, uh, losing a bit, uh, why do we need uh, this kind of technologies? And on the other hand, uh, they are selling the same, let's say, traditional stuff in which uh, they feel comfortable. That is mainly, uh, I don't call it accessible, but it's uh, use, useful for, for everyone. So uh, here, what... Uh, the challenge right now and what we are trying to to find right because the, <laughs> it's still uh, unknown how, how, how to fit uh, the, the balance between technology and, and usefulness is uh, in which way we can keep uh, the all the advances that uh, have been created in the last years and at the same time uh, offer solutions for for people who really need one of the most typical things that is said uh, about uh, smart kitchen is uh, this is a niche market, but no one is uh, betting for any particular niche. So at the end, it's like, uh, okay, my oven can do a lot of stuff, but uh, it's actually more difficult to use it than uh, when I just can control the temperature and the time. So yeah. Uh, this I've is got the, great, the I've, balance I've, we, we need to. <laughs> to absolutely. Find. So my 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 sister got married a couple of years back, and and you know these days when you get married you get a list of sort of presents and so on, and she ended up with a, um, a quite an expensive microwave, um, mm -hmm. and I've watched her husband who is a you know he's an engineer, so mm -hmm. he's you know <laughs> um, using the microwave. And it's got all of these buttons and all of these programs, and all he ever uses is the plus 30 seconds button. Keeps adding an extra 30 <laughs> seconds and presses cook <laughs> because yeah, everything yeah, yeah. else is too complicated. So, 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 so I think you know that there has to be this kind of and 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 I have the most basic microwave um, out. It's it's pretty ancient and it's got the two two dials, the one mm. for how strong the, the the cooking thing is and the for the time <laughs> and, and and that's all i all i need uh, i mean th yeah. that said you, you can yeah. have complexity mm -hmm. um but it but it it needs to be in the background so i i, I guess exactly. your challenge is to 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 take that innovation and 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 to a large extent hide it away from the user yeah, um, exactly. So that they only get it when they need it. So, so I, I think if we stick with microwaves, I also saw Amazon demonstrating a, an Alexa-powered mm -hmm. microwave um, yeah. in in Washington earlier this year, and and my immediate thought was that's great. You can say Alexa, cook my chicken, and it knows that it's chicken. But what they needed to add was a a weight scale, mm -hmm. because then you'd know exactly how long to cook the chicken for so that you didn't give yourself food poisoning yeah <laughs> especially if and i'm thinking in in the cases of, of of people who have specific learning difficulties or people who are blind actually mm -hmm. you know a voice enabled microwave 
would be really, really useful. I never thought I would say voice enabled kitchen appliances would be useful. I'm converted. I can see the utility. Mm -hmm. But with something like chicken, where you can give yourself food poisoning, you need to cook it for the right amount of time. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there are lots of other scenarios that you can imagine. Yeah. Where yeah. you could do similar things. Yeah, indeed, one of the most uh, the typical application for smart home is uh, the appliance in which uh, more features have been added is the oven and the microwave, basically to control the full process and assure, a, let's say, 100% accurate uh, finish of, of the products. However, this is not happening because uh, cooking depends a lot on where you are, what is the humidity, if the heat is properly dist distributed, which model you are using. Uh, so it's uh, quite a complex thing. And for me, the funniest thing so far is that uh, this is called auto programs. And the auto programs, uh, we, we did a benchmark a few months ago. And we, we found that uh, auto programs requires 11 steps from the users. So it's not so auto. Uh, no. We can call it programs, okay. But uh, yeah, that, that's uh, something that at the end, when, when we try with, uh, with users, the, um, the apps that are already in the market, uh, everyone tells us it's too complex to use it. I know how to cook my, my chicken. So it's easier to go and do it manually. So uh, what we are doing is, is take all these lessons and uh, take the value of, of things, not try to make things more complex than uh, currently are, and try to solve a specific problems for uh, a specific needs. That's, that's what, what we need. As you said before, uh, we need to hide the complexity. If things are more complicated just for being more sophisticated, people are not going to pay more for, for them. If we are not solving specific problems with the solutions we are uh, providing, uh, there is no added value of, of uh, spending 2,000 uh, euros on a, an oven when I can buy for doing the same things I'm going to, I know how to do uh, for, for half of the price. So yeah. this is uh, where we are right now, trying to identify for whom we are going to uh, create this value and in which way, because here the the, the opportunity is uh, how ICT technologies make things easier for us uh, to provide these, uh, these solutions for, for, I don't like the word niches, but uh, maybe for the people that have a, a particular needs. Because there are many different things that could be done. It could be really quick tested and the added value of, of, of that things could be much higher than any new feature in the oven in the way that the cook is prepared, the food is prepared. Okay. Nobody wants to have a piece of uh, uh, a place at home where technology becomes decorative, you know, something that can show friends who have all these features. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that, that's it. And you pay premium price for something that you never use. Uh, mm -hmm. So, appliances sometimes uh, are one of, uh, is something that that g go old with you. So while you no, know, it's not something that you replace every day. Mm -hmm. So how can you find the balance between building something, creating something today, and some needs that might arise in the future? You know, how can you? Uh, so you are talking about okay, this looking at a, a niche, uh, a solution here. But you know, we we you, you we know well that's always occasions in our life that we might we might uh, be limited because we are sick uh, for some reason we're not feeling well or mm -hmm. because we have a kind of a, an accident who disrupted our daily activities and we are, may not be able to use those, those appliances. How how do you keep the balance between you know making the product? Uh, making that, you know, having a, a revenue margin, making sure that you make a profit of it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, having, uh, being able to, that, that product to be useful for people who, who buy it through their life journey. Yeah, uh, that, that's a, a very good question, by the way. Uh, th there is, let's say, two parts of this, uh, for, for this problem. On the one hand is how the appliances work. And this is mainly mechanic things, uh, power electronics, 
And this is something that we, uh, I mean, we can live with it for, for long, for, for many years. I mean, there are uh, fridges that uh, well, could last for 20, 25 years, and you would not notice uh, the difference from day one to, to, the, to the final day. The same with the oven or, or with the hop or well, with the hood, there is more, let's say, uh, well, decorative uh, aspects because it's uh, in a different position in the kitchen. But let's say that in the way they work, you can live with them uh, for, for long periods uh, without any issue. Uh, the opportunity comes with uh, ICT technologies. Why, once you introduce um, connectivity for all these appliances, you are taking an interface or a way of using it uh, different from, from the one that is already embedded. And this is something that can evolve in the time quickly without any uh, big problem for, for the manage of the appliance itself. And that offers a lot of opportunities for, for the manufacturers like, um, like us uh, to bring in new things, to solve problems in a clear manner, to be scalable and also to create new revenue, uh, new revenues. Uh, one of the, well, I would say challenges or the ideas we have is that uh, at the end there will be some basic features that we need to provide through ICT technologies and it could be an, uh, an application in your mobile phone but it could be also through Alexa, Google Home or whatever interface that uh, could arise in the future. And the, the second part is how to make this sustainable in time, what kind of uh, premium services or what kind of partners we will find to make this sustainable and at the end uh, allow companies to keep investing on, on the digital uh, part of, of the kitchen, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, th thinking of the digital part of the kitchen, um, and I've just been browsing through the range, um, while well, we talk, you know, the, everyone loves the clean lines of the modern kitchen, mm -hmm. um, and you've got lots of touch interfaces, you know, lots of uh, uh, so on. So, are are you exploring things like haptics right now? So, because you've got lots, of, there's lots of glass, you've, uh, you know, not just within your your range, but you know, that's the the trend in kitchens right now. Everything's glossy, flat, flush. Yes. No, nothing standing out. So, I mean, one of the things that I'm I'm super interested in is how you can give the illusion of touch. So you can have things like mid-air haptics. So you could actually enable someone to be, um, again, and this this will work for everyone, but it will specifically work for someone who's blind. Um, you know, having something that feels like a control rather mm -hmm. um, that enables you to sort of control it. And, ag and again, it might be a way of, of uh, bringing back some of the simplicity. Um, mm -hmm. Just just curious if those kind of things are on on your radar. Not, not, not so much from an inclusion point of view, but just generally because uh, often we see design trends going in, in divergent directions from technology. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, 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 you hit the right point. Uh, indeed, uh, the trend is try to hide everything and looks like you don't have a kitchen in your kitchen <laughs> yes. or you don't have the appliances in your kitchen. Mm -hmm. And what uh, has been done so far uh, in terms of uh, inclusivity is basically to keep the same appliances like uh, we had uh, 20, 25 years ago with all mechanic parts, uh, big, uh, making easier to check uh, what are the, um, the warm phones of the, um, of the kitchen. Uh, that's what uh, we would like to, to change a bit because at the end that is the kind of things that ICT technologies could provide and you will not create in a gap between uh, how you are providing inclusivity and how you are providing adv advanced te technologies for uh, let's say people that don't have any special need. So, uh, for bridging the, um, this, this gap, uh, we, we need to, to use the ICT technologies because otherwise uh, you will keep always some, someone behind. And uh, that is something that, uh, well, on the one hand is not fair, but besides that, uh, you are losing an important uh, 
share of the market that uh, can really get the value of uh, of these kind of uh, of interfaces. So it's uh, yeah, that, that that is the way we. <laughs> well, I think that the whole industry is, is planning to 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 evolve. Well, no, in in a in a kind of an indirect way, uh, uh, when appliances started to have more technology embedded and more connectivity you somehow need to get the trust from consumers yeah. okay can i my fridge is connected can i really trust it to connect it to my to my wi-fi how can i make sure that this is secure and suddenly you have to patch your fridge there's a software update there that you need to make sure that it happens and it needs to happen over a period of time not just the first three patches uh, hmm. So, how do you find ways where you are able to, you know, sell the product, but at the same time keep an ongoing process where consumers can trust in your products, because nobody wants to arrive home and suddenly uh, all every, the fridge is open, something happened just because somebody hmm. messed it up with the network. Yeah, uh, indeed, for for us, uh, for, for Teka, the, the higher purpose we have is uh, creating meaningful moments. And this is something we have in mind when designing uh, solutions for the kitchen. Uh, one of the trends that uh, we, we see in the market is that, uh, well, most of the efforts are put on automation of processes. And kitchen is uh, a place to enjoy, to share, uh, it's a kind of uh, contradiction. We, we are trying to keep you the complexity of the things you enjoy doing. So th this is uh, one of the first barriers we, we, we need to, to remove. And also, as, as you pointed out, how to build trust on, on connected appliances. Uh, the only way is by providing useful services. If the service deserves, the, let's say, the risk, people is going to, because technology wise is not a, a big problem. I mean, we have a lot of IoT things at home and people is not complaining about how secure they are. Of course, uh, all of them should be secure, but if we are not uh, providing any, let's say, added value, people is not going to take the risk. And here is where, where well, uh, the, the most of the effort should be put in the, in the short term. For the cybersecurity, software updates, and, and all the things, uh, well, the regulators are creating means, basically because um, one another difficult point here with the smart appliances is that, uh, okay, I can buy a, a smart appliance for my mother or for my grandma, and probably she's not the best person to apply a software update to, to it. Uh, but if they do not apply it, uh, they are putting, let's say, uh, an oven could be up to 300 degrees Celsius. So do we want to open this to, to happen? So how to automate these processes, in which way we should ask for um, uh, users' uh, permission to, this, uh, to, to do this kind of, of updates? There are a lot of regulation there, also in the way the, the products are conceived. We are following, a, I think it's not the same, but <clears throat> quite similar uh, software certification processes as uh, autonomous vehicles. So uh, it's a challenge, but the, the problem is not the technology, it's uh, why people should, try, tr should trust and try these uh, connected appliances. The, the service is what is going to make uh, people make the step or keep in the same, in the same position. Yeah, I think it's the same with, with, with every technology. We're mm. prepared to give away information about ourselves if we think that by doing so, we're going to gain some kind of advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be beneficial to our lives. So um, sometimes we do it unthinkingly. You know, we, we're, we're downloading these like tiny little apps and stuff like that. And, you know, hmm. this is a tiny little utility and it uploads your entire address book and tracks everything you're doing and all this kind of stuff. But other times, you know, I think, you know, with 
obviously social networks there's been a lot of uh, press about what they've been doing and uploading data and tracking you and so on and so forth I think that with with uh, household appliances again the, you know, the there are these areas of privacy that you've mm -hmm. you've got to overcome you know say uh, if you want an always on always listening device um, you know how's that data anonymized those kind of questions become come more to the fore but I, I think that that to a certain extent the genie's out of the bottle what we really need to do is yeah as you say have the regulatory framework around it the, the checks and balances so that so that people can feel um, a reasonable amount of uh, comfort that they're not going to be uh, con continuously surveilled in in their own home, because yeah. yeah, otherwise I'm going to be buying a dumb oven for for the for, for the foreseeable future because I don't I I you know I I don't want to you know reporting back on my kitchen table conversations so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's that that element of trust, but also the the trust that it's not going to burn your house down, the trust that it's not going to be, a, you know, a security leak and and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So um, that comfort level, I don't think it's entirely there yet with customers. Do you think? Do you, you know, I mean, you're working for a, you know, tech as an a, an international company. Do you see differences between uh, people's comfort levels in different? Uh, among different nationalities and different groups yeah yeah definitely yes uh, indeed uh, one of the top producers for, for appliances is China and the, the level of services or, or the degree of penetration into um, uh, people's life is much higher there they, they have a lot of details on, on how they consume how they behave they don't have the GDPR, which uh, helps <laughs> for that part, although it's not necessarily good. And uh, th they are providing services uh, focused on health advice that uh, it's uh, quite, uh, I mean, uh, consumers there accept them in, in, a good, uh, in a good way. In Europe, the only um, success story I'm aware of is uh, Thermomix. I don't know if you... It's a cooking robot and it has a version that connects to the internet and through an app you can get your plan for the whole week and uh, they allow you to prepare everything in one day and you don't have to cook for the rest of the week. So this is something that is working, it's a connected product and it takes into consideration what you are planning to to it for, for, for a full week. So it's uh, an example that uh, the problem is not the connectivity, the problem is not uh, how to make uh, people trust on a connected appliance, the problem is uh, how to build useful services that uh, people is willing to pay and use. So uh, th this is uh, also a, an example of, uh, well, what is the path we should take or what are the ideas that uh, that have been successful in in Europe in the US they are now starting with uh, also with connected products but uh, it's uh, something or the, the pace of the market is uh, similar to to the european ones for well putting remotely the um, the washing machine things works for all the other things uh, people is not so willing to pay for the extra cost of uh, connected products. They can buy them, but they do not connect them. And this is a, another thing that, uh, that figures show, is that uh, below 20% of, um, of the connected appliance, uh, appliances uh, sold are connected for the first time. And it's around 5% of them which are regularly used as connected products. So uh, the decision for, for purchasing um, uh, an appliance is not the technology that is uh, behind, it's how, fit, how good or bad they fit in, uh, in our kitchen, if we do like uh, the colors, if uh, things are, uh, I mean, it's cool in, in terms of, uh, of the, the handle, 
So uh, people is not asking, is this a connected product? They are asking, uh, fit in my, in, in my gap, I can put it in the place of my previous uh, oven. So uh, the drivers uh, are, are not the ones that we are pushing with, uh, with ICT technologies, but at the same time, we need to create the value to, to make people aware that, uh, well, uh, it's not only uh, the product that I will put in my kitchen, is also what it uh, entails uh, through an app or through an, a conversational interface or through a haptic, so whatever we want to, whatever technology we could apply. So it's a, uh, well, it's a new market for, for, the, for, for the manufacturers, but also we need to make a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, to raise the awareness and educate the consumers on the benefits. But if there is no clear benefits, uh, we can invest a lot of uh, raising awareness that people is not going to take the, the new solutions. But do we know that Amazon has a, 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 mm -hmm. a, a interesting potential market, and they, and in, in the United States, uh, they are in sectors that they are not uh, in Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. do, do you do you see, let's say, large supermarket chains in, in Europe uh, getting interested about the opportunities that can arise from having these devices uh, connected at home? And as and connecting to somehow to their online markets and things like that. Yes, the, well, uh, the reality is that uh, when I started in, I think it was 2010, more or less, we started to work with a connected fridge that automatically ask uh, create your order for the supermarket. So this is something, this is, I think, the first application that was created for smart homes. But uh, nowadays, it's not working. <laughs> so uh, for sure, this is one important thing because you will create a, a direct link between the, um, uh, the need and uh, the provision of the needs. So uh, the, the, the challenge or what uh, or the keystone that uh, has not been found yet is in which way user can control this process. Because uh, the typical case of the fridge is, okay, I'm running out of milk in my fridge, but I have uh, six bottles in uh, <laughs> out of the fridge. So why to create a new uh, order if I, I still have? So it, it's wh what is the position of, of the um, of people uh, for accepting that this is uh, something that uh, can be placed? One approach that is also followed is uh, through uh, receipts. Uh, you can make a receipt in, in in the oven, and the oven will configure automatically to do it perfectly. There is easy, easier uh, to take all the all the ingredients, ask them to to a supermarket, and get your uh, your order at, your order at home. But uh, it's still something that uh, okay, everyone thinks that uh, it's something useful, but the reality is a complex context that should be always driven by the, um, by the owner of the appliance. But, but I, I also noticed that, not, that also um, more in, in, in Europe, in the countries that I, I tend to, to move, you know, in Portugal and, I, and Ireland, even the, the online experience of the supermarkets is not particularly appealing, you know. Uh, you can really be as confused in their online uh, websites than inside the supermarket. So sometimes I feel that they haven't they haven't sorted out their online markets yet at the level that people can easily buy. And sometimes mm -hmm. the fact that they are still at a certain level of understanding digitalization is also somehow limiting them from understanding the opportunities of uh, of appliances. But that's just a, a personal mm -hmm. opinion. I, I think um, UK-wise, the major supermarkets are trying to get better uh, with their online uh, offering. Um, it's interesting to see the, the, the efforts from uh, Waitrose and Tesco's and Sainsbury's and so on, but they've been led by a 100% online supermarket, which is Ocado in the UK. And, and, and that, that online shopping experience is really good. Mm -hmm. You know, you you can search for the the products. It it 
will do all of the sort of suggestion stuff. You can do the sort of one-click shop, uh, quickly load up your common items and all this kind of stuff, you know, have delivery times at times, but the user is still in control. It's not fully automated. Um, mm -hmm. I think the other the other areas where, where we're kind of interested in and you, you might um, you know, think about is, is also, and, and people are talking about getting rid of waste and packaging and all of this kind of stuff. To a certain extent, if you're ordering ingredients, they're going to come pre-prepared, pre-packed. Now, um, that has pros and cons. The pros is actually it's really good for um, you know single people. It's really good for people with disabilities that have trouble. You know, maybe they've got rheumatoid arthritis. They can't you know, hold a knife or a peeler properly, and so you can take the stuff put it in the oven, have it cooked perfectly and have a nutritious meal better than um, you know, a microwave meal, you know, because mm -hmm. you're you're cooking fresh ingredients. At the same time, it comes with packaging which has a you know a, an, an effect on the environment. So it's you know, what what we what I hope to see is that we're going to start to see much more cooperation across ecosystems Exactly. where uh, you're, you're working um, with manufacturers and supply chains and packaging and so on. So because what, what we, we've done all of these verticals and these silos where, where people are operating and actually our lives don't operate in silos. We cross all of these things. Our lives are horizontal. And so therefore we, you know, we have an impact and if we can start having a, a horizontal joined up approach to the way that we are, you know, providing, you know, stuff for people in their homes, mm -hmm. then I think we, we can have a positive impact on people's quality of life, but we can also have a positive impact on, on, on the planet. Are there groups, are there uh, industry groups that are starting to, to, to look at this stuff that you're aware of? Uh, well, this is a well, a big challenge here. Uh, basically, uh, you 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 uh, presented it perfectly. For me, IoT is about uh, breaking silos. It's uh, basically connect things to create new ecosystems to find who can get value from what you are offering and know in which way I'm going to get value from what I have put in my in my appliance. And this is something that requires a change of the mindset of everyone in the in the market. That takes time, but at the same time, uh, they are starting to see the potential because it is not only the packaging. At the end, if we have uh, appliances with uh, connectivity and we, have, we know that, uh, well, uh, putting the washing machine or doing a pyrolysis to clean the, the oven consumes a lot of energy. If we have a partnership with an energy company, we can align uh, product peak of uh, renewable production to uh, reduce fossil fuels dependency. So this kind of new ecosystem uh, has to be created. So far, there are some groups of, uh, of uh, manufacturers that are working on creating interoperable environments, but still is a bit, uh, not, not is a silo because they are working with uh, energy companies. But uh, the mind should be, uh, or the mindset should be changed uh, radically. It's uh, the offering we can create with our appliances. I mean, any uh, connected uh, product at home goes far beyond the specific use we foresee in our own industry right now. It's uh, you are part of a much bigger ecosystem, which is not only a house but also a building, a neighborhood, and a city. So combining all these things, or should be combined somehow, to make effective use of uh, the resources. Electricity, mobility, water, everything. And also for food delivery, it's, uh, well, uh, it's a challenge not only for, for, uh, for, for how to put things properly, but also how to deliver things on time with good quality and in, in a way that is uh, sustainable for, for everyone. And well, uh, this is a new thing that is quite surprising in, in some or for some of my colleagues is a circular economy uh, has been or there will be a new regulation from the European Commission. Uh, well, let's say forcing us to implement uh, measures to support uh, 
circular economy. One of, of the measures included is uh, self-repair of uh, appliances. It's not an easy task, but we have to change our mindset to allow people to do it. And this change of mindset is enabling new ideas that uh, takes, uh, well, to unexplore uh, places and new business can, can came from, from that part. So it's uh, well, a matter of ecosystem and who will be participating in the ecosystem and when we invite people to participate uh, here. Because if the maturity of the solutions is not so uh, good, uh, we can miss opportunities. But at the same time, if we never take the risks to invite new people, we will not be creating enough value to, 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 the, connected, to the connectivity inside the, the product so yeah that's uh yeah the, the path we have to follow because we don't have another choice uh, and and i'm kind of excited that they've not given you that choice to be honest because i think it's it's a really interesting challenge um what what uh i i know that that some manufacturers have been making high quality goods but the built-in obsolescence of, of white goods has been you know, hmm. well documented over the last few decades. Um, whilst some fridges may last 20 years, a lot of other household goods go pop after you know, a couple of months after the warranty expires. Which is why you know retailers make a, you know make a fortune out of selling extended warranties. Mm -hmm. for, for me, you know, our impact on the planet can be vastly improved by allowing this kind of modularity and repairability of products, whether it's self-repair or engineer repair, but that, that kind of thing's, I think, something that we have to do as responsible organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited about that. So sometimes legislation brings about good things. I know we've reached the end of our time. Um, mm -hmm. wish we, uh, there's lots of other stuff I could think about talking about, but hopefully we can bring some of that to Twitter. So thank you, Juan. I'd uh, obviously like to thank all of the great supporters that we have for Access Chat, particularly those that you know keep the uh, the lights on and the captioning going. So Barclays Access, who have been ever present for the last three years, Microlink, who are also great supporters, and of course MyClearText for providing the quality captions that enable everyone to access our videos. So thank you very much. Thank you.